Hello, I'm Richard Lowenberg, and welcome to Arts and Sciences Telluride 19... Uh, I'm at the wrong year. Mm -hmm. uh, 2024, uh, commemorating uh, the fact that uh, I organized a similar program without Zoom, without uh, cell phones, without any of the communication systems we have. Back in 1979, when I first moved to Telluride, and uh, actually, to my surprise, we have a few people entering this room behind me to watch this. So, yeah. and uh, uh, so that that's very pleasant. They're just gonna. We didn't. We're not projecting today. Just um, anyway, for those uh, watching from home or from anywhere in the world, um, arts and sciences. The program theme throughout twelve laser Zoom programs over eight days has been the nature of information. Uh, and uh, that refers to the fact that um, information, according to physics, is fundamental. Uh, along with energy and matter, uh, it is the foundation of the universe. It is the uh, basis for the origin of life. Uh, and every microsystem, every RNA, protein, uh, lipid, and DNA senses, communicates, responds to its environment, and even reproduces information as well as physiology of some sort. Uh, so information surrounds us. It is not just a human uh, byproduct. It's not just language. It's not just computing and AI. Information is... Uh, is our reality, in fact. Uh, information is here, information is out there. And uh, one of the concerns I've had as a creative person has been that I don't think we can actually address grand challenge issues such as climate change, such as population migrations, such as economic change, all the big issues that are facing us with deep concern as well as with optimism potentially. Uh, unless we also practice some sort of eco-minded, uh, to quote Gregory Bateson, an eco-minded approach to how we understand the information environment. And that's been the basis of this program. We've only touched on little pieces of a very complex puzzle. So today we're doing a program uh, with uh, a small organization I've encountered earlier in the year called Artists with Evidence. And uh, I will introduce them in a moment. And they are being joined by a friend of mine, originally from Cameroon, currently uh, at the moment based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. His name is Issa Niafaga. Um, everybody will introduce themselves further in a moment. But uh, I want to introduce the three members with us today that are part of Artists with Evidence. Uh, Ines Montalbao, originally from Portugal, connecting from Helsinki, Finland. Uh, Ali Akbar Meta, uh, who's joining us also from Helsinki. And uh, Colin Greer, who is in New York City. Uh, three remarkable individuals, and I'm going to hand it right over to Ines Montalbao to begin. Okay, thank you. And thanks for inviting to join this uh, this program. Uh, to clarify a little bit, um, we are, both me and Colin and Ali, we, we are working with AWE in different ways. So I am program director for AWE. Colin Greer is a uh, part of our board also. And Ali is actually one of the um, creatives in our network too. And together we've been hosting a series of conversations called Echo Effect. Uh, conversations on war and environment. And that's how Richard came across AWE, which stands for Artists with Evidence. And uh, so we'll briefly go more into that uh, after we present ourselves and our own practices. So as I understood, you want me to start off with presenting myself and my, my practice. So 
As you said, I am Portuguese, I'm from Portugal, and I'm based in Helsinki in Finland. And I'm working as program director for Artists with Evidence, which is an organization, a nonprofit organization based in the US. <laughs> so a bit all over the place. But um, in short, my, my own practice is focused on art science. I have a background in biology. I've worked with in different aspects of the arts too. And so I kind of combine uh, a whole spectrum of ways that I can then translate into usually narrative environments. So either through curating or illustration, and and using all these techniques to to create experiences i've been working for many years with science museums and science centers in creating uh science and society exhibitions and uh within the art science focused uh practice i have uh i i have co-founded uh, a collective called mandarina collective uh, I am part of another collective called the Non-Random Arts Collective. And um, and I have a project called Lingua Plante that uh, delves into plant-human interaction and communication. Um, yeah, and I noticed that you referred to me in the, in the webpage for the program as an artist in residence for the SETI Institute in 2024-2025. And that's uh, a residency together with the non-random arts collective. So looking into planet habitability, gene editing, speculative futures. So yeah, in a nutshell, I would say that that is me. <laughs> Thank you, Ines. Uh, I'm going to turn it right over to Ali Akbar Mehta. Ali. Hi, Richard, and uh, thank you for having us here. Um, to introduce myself, I'm a transmedia artist, a curator, researcher, and a writer. Um, a lot of my practice since uh, the past decade actually has been to create uh, archival projects that are um, not always, but often um, in, situated in digital technologies. Um, they also explore digital technologies as the world develops them in hopes of uh, shifting the focus of uh, how we think about archiving and how we actually archive information and knowledges uh, around us, uh, away from the traditional or what I like to call legacy archive methodologies uh, of state and institutional archives that have been historically embedded within um, colonial strategies and colonial understandings of information, um, categorization, and essentially the, the nature of value itself because the idea of archiving has been traditionally embedded with uh, the understanding of what is valuable. And in a day and age today, when the, the nature of value itself is being questioned, I think archiving as a practice, especially within artistic and cultural realms, um, to question the nature of value is a very important uh, action. Uh, the archival work that I do, the thematics, the thematical frameworks actually are uh, orbiting around uh, notions of violence, conflict, and uh, trauma. <clears throat> and uh, uh, my hope is that in examining narratives uh, drawn from zones of conflict and dominant power structures and structural violences, essentially, also, uh, that uh, my projects, in a way, foreground overlooked bodies, data, networks, and ecologies. And through these archival practices, what I hope to do is to generate a conception of uh, how we understand knowledge, how we interface with it, and how we uh, learn from it. How, um, when we teach archival systems or information systems, especially within digital frameworks, 
uh, there are human biases that get embedded within them. And then when in turn we learn from archives and information systems, those biases which have become structural or algorithmic biases, which, which are not just um, uh, uh, errors or mistakes, but designed features of technology today, uh, those biases in turn inform us and teach us. So it's a vicious cycle, but it's also a cybernetic loop. So my research currently is uh, essentially looking at how uh, the cybernetic loops of biases actually get uh, reproduced and uh, per perpetrated. Uh, beyond that, as a curator, I've been working um, often within exhibition making context, but uh, essentially um, I like to think of my curatorial practice as that of um, <clears throat> facilitating a kind of a, a social and a socio-political space, uh, a socio-political commons, often a information commons, if you will, since we're talking about uh, information in such a central uh, space. And uh, previously, I have been um, the artistic director of uh, Museum of Impossible Forms, which is a art and culture space in Helsinki. I've been the um, one of the co-curators of the Helsinki Biennale last uh, year, yes, 2023. And um, um, yeah, this is essentially a, a kind of a multi-threaded, multi-directional practice of um, um, artistic, curatorial, but also a kind of an infrastructural practice of understanding the world around us. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. And uh, just to move this along, we will <clears throat> switch over to Colin Greer, uh, who's joining us in New York. Thanks, Richard. Um, thanks for inviting us and thanks for giving us the time. Um, always tricky to condense who one is, um, so I'll try to say a few things. Um, I was going to end with, but I will begin with the fact that I have eight grandchildren, um, and um, it's a, it has been for me both through my children and my grandchildren, a tremendous um, education in how, in fact, information is created and communicated. Um, one of the interesting things always is that the um, the middle range of the kids end up understanding the young ones who are just learning to speak much quicker, much more quickly than the adults understand them. So one often turns to the seven-year-old and say, what is, what is she trying to say? Um, and pretty accurately get it. So it summarizes for me an interest I have across the range of my work over the years, which is the, the nature of meaning and the authority that conveys it um, and how we then um, ascribe value to meaning through the authorities that convey them. Um, and therefore, authority becomes both challengeable and um, remakeable as we seek to understand the world independent of the authorities that, that um, <clears throat> from whom we inherit it. Um, so a little bit, I, I um, direct a foundation in New York City. It's a former civil rights foundation. <clears throat> it has over the years moved from a family foundation to a community foundation. Its board members are all community leaders. There are no family members or um, or aristocrats on our board any longer. And um, the, the board um, ensures that we, in fact, carry a new mission, which is to work with groups on the ground, uh, mostly in the United States, to make change from the ground up, um, recognizing both that systems are disrupted by individuals who assert themselves and that community is made on the ground, not by some assertion of ideology from the top down. Um, so the foundation operates on that perspective and we fund in 30 states and we fund community action as we call it. Um, it often is political action, but political action at the local level, um, problems designed and understood at the local level and efforts to solve them, much the way historically a farmer might solve the problem on the farm um, but then got copyrighted by uh, the owner of the farm or the slave owner 
um, the Reaper being a case in point where a slave invented it and it was um, copyrighted, patented by the slave owner. Um, so interested in about how the life is created on the ground, how change is created from the ground up. The foundation is focused on that. As a social science teacher, which I was 20 some years before I went to the foundation, that was the focus of how I worked. I ran for the most part uh, programs at City University, each of the branches of City University um, for children who otherwise would not have gone to college and created opportunity structures for them to actually um, advance their learning and their standing. But from the proposition that, very much a Frarian point of view, from the proposition that they came with knowledge and that they would learn best if the knowledge they came with was respected and articulated. So as Ali might say, a, a feedback loop between knowledge brought and knowledge acquired, um, and both change in the course of that interaction. Um, I was, while teaching, and still continue to be a um, kind of quasi-journalist, I edited a series of magazines and wrote a column for Parade Magazine for 20 years in which I interviewed people like uh, Bishop Tutu, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, and was able to um, see the world from a point of view that was different from the one I grew up in and the one I taught from. I uh, met some wonderful people, and that column blew my mind because back then millions of readers was was significant, and when I was writing for it, it had 60 million readers. Um, so that was an interesting experience when my academic writing maybe was read by a thousand people. Um, and um, meeting people like Bishop Tutu was a great education for me because I understood for the first time that one can be um, lionized, but at the same time remain quite humble. Um, and if people are interested, I could tell some stories about that later. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> excuse me, I work in the arts. Um, I've written several plays that were performed around the country, um, <clears throat> most particularly in New York. Um, and I write poetry and have written several books of poetry um, with a new one on the way, I hope. And in, with respect to AWE, we've had two productions of my poetry, which has been very, very exciting. One was called Treaty Between Self and Earth, in which other members of the AWE network composed, danced, and sang to a long poem. And we're now working on a something of an epic poem on war and environment called When the Smoke Clears. And that is um, composition by, um, again, the network of artists and three wonderful singers and a great director. Um, and that probably will be performed at La Mama toward the end of this year. And that's probably enough for me. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Um, you, uh, I hope I don't jump the gun here, but you mentioned the uh, possibility of reading or reciting a poem or two during this program. You want mm -hmm. to do that a bit later, or do you want to do something right now? No, let's do it a bit later so that other people have a okay. chance to speak. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm eager to hear. Um, from you. Is there a, a bit of a, 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 a additional discussion about artists with evidence we want to do before we move on sure. to? Issa. Yeah, let's just uh, a little more about artists with evidence. It's actually yeah. a fairly large, large group and very diverse. And uh, I'd love to hear a little more. Yeah, I can I can maybe share a little more about artists with evidence. Uh, maybe if I share the screen and I show. Uh, now you're looking at our link tree, which is the link that we have in our bio on Instagram. And this is where we we usually update people on, on what's happening at AWE. And just to start off with, with how Colin, Ali, and myself have uh, kind of come to be <laughs> this, this group and why we're here today, I, I assume. So the Echo Effect series. So at the, at this moment, you can access uh, the link tree. I can share the link on the chat later. Uh, you can actually watch uh, three of our conversations. We'll have six conversations and Echo Effect conversations on war and environment is a series of six conversations that we're hosting and curating and then having guests joining in 
Um, we'll have the last three from September to November. And at the moment, these three are available. And we are looking at war and environment uh, from different perspectives and bringing in different guests. So for example, our last conversation, we our angle was with fermentation, which might not be your most expected topic when you're talking about war and environment, but this is how we've been coming across and moving through these conversations and then letting them grow in a way organically. The, the reason why Echo Effect came to be is that as Ali mentioned about his work. Um... So basically, when I first came across Ali's work, uh, we mm -hmm. talked about his incredible work with uh, archiving and uh, this purgatory archive that Ali has been compiling, which is now at, I, I dare say, 40,000 entries. <laughs> uh, it's, com it's comprised of video footage and uh home home videos news micro documentary so a lot a lot of information that is focusing on um conflict and violence but what was really surprising and astonishing for me was how much of peace there was in that in that archival uh, uh footage because you can't really understand one without the other. And that was not only touching, but very inspiring. And it led me to think about how could we combine and recombine the work of Ali with Colin's work and his poetry. And specifically the poem that, that uh, Colin mentioned about uh, the 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 poem that has been worked into a performance at the moment, so called When the Smoke Clears and the Earth is the Earth for All That. And so the idea that came up was, what if we would put AI in the mix and recombine these two works and kind of see what is the outcome? And this is how the whole thing started, the whole discussion and echo effect as a project. And then I was having these incredible conversations, Zoom talk, conversations online with the two of them. And we, we started thinking this would be something that would be great to share, to have uh, different eyes and different input into that. And hopefully this is at least our expectation that this will also inform where this project will go once we start also developing it. So, so this is kind of the thing that brought us all together and that brought us here today. But with Artists with Evidence, we have other programs. So earlier this year, we had the Climate and Death uh, program where we had a seminar day looking at climate and death from very different perspectives and not just an anthropocentric perspective, but kind of beyond human multi-species perspectives. And there is a recording for this um, Transcending Boundaries, which was a conversation in person that happened in Helsinki. Uh, but gladly it was recorded and you can find a really interesting discussion on climate and death from the view of two multidisciplinary artists, one activist working with the Arctic and a, a scientist also working on decay. So, this is a bit of uh, the programs we've been on about. Uh, from here, you can, of course, uh, there is the, our website and within the website, you can see, for example, here, if you go into the creative network, we have a, about 50 creatives in our network. You can explore uh, their work, what they've been doing, where they are from, and yeah, and if you are an artist or a scientist, anyone creative working in art science, you're welcome to submit a collaborative form and and then have your uh, profile um, and your work displayed in our in our network. Mm -hmm.
I can I can I add something to that? Um, thanks, Ines. So um, one of the reasons that the AW was created um, and became a home for this kind of content that Ines is describing is because the experience of other board members with science organizations was a reluctance to include arts because of a fear that they would under, undermine the um, public view of their science, that the kind of the softness of the arts in their point of view would undermine the integrity or, um, afforded their scientific advocacy and work. So we respected that and tried to create a partnership between science and art um, through AWE. Um, and it's it's um, perhaps I can explain the space just by giving a, a quote. W. H. Auden said that poetry doesn't do anything; it does nothing. He said that was the quote. It does nothing, and I think a fairer way to say it would be: it doesn't do something in the way you would expect a lineal progression, but it creates a space to say things that otherwise can't be said, which is what the arts allow. It's the opening of a space. Um, there's a line in, in my, when the smoke clears, runs something like, beyond analysis, just short of despair. You can't say that any other way but in poetry. Um, but that space beyond analysis is a space that one can occupy and see the world differently from. It's allowing for a different kind of information to come through and a different kind of engagement. So that's sort of what we're aiming for. We're partners with science, but we recognize and, and respected that scientists wanted in a different kind of organization. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this resonates deeply for me personally, so I'm very appreciative of your being part of this program today. Um, all right, we're going to just uh, shift uh, to our other presenter here today, uh, and uh, I'll say to those who are uh, uh, watching this session, that uh, Issa Niafaga, who I'm about to introduce, and the artists with evidence have not met before. And so after Issa's uh, uh, presentation and introduction to himself, um, I hope we open this up to a very uh, enjoyable and provocative and inspiring conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. So right now, uh, to the smiling Isa Niafag, go. Thank, thank you, Richard. And thank you all for having me and for introducing me to the conversation. Uh, my name is Isa Niafaga. I was born in Cameroon and I am an artist. I'm also, um, I'm actually a multimedia artist and uh, I am a community organizer. Uh, you can also say I'm a global community organizer. And I came from an indigenous um, tribe called the Chica people. We make art and farming in the rainforest. And um, I moved to the city when I was an adult, uh, a teenager actually, before I was an adult to become a cartoonist in a newspaper. And so we deal with censorship in Cameroon, which led me to several trips to prison, and jailed and also experienced torture as an artist mm. because back then uh, my government uh, established the censorship as a law to ban journalism, cartooning, and even slammers and all kind of poetry and writings. And so we just have to stand against it because um, uh, something could be a law, but it doesn't mean it's fair. So actually when you see the landscape of uh, of our modern world today most people who violate human rights are people those we pay taxes to to have a good retirement benefit and good uh, paychecks you know most of them i don't think uh, the uh, russian mafia or the chinese mafia even the mexican mafia do damage damage in human rights violation than most governments you know so i'm in 1996 i have to go to paris in exile because my life was uh, on the thread so i live in paris from 1996 to 2006 when i started traveling to the u.s 
And so after those years, uh, for about 10 years, I was uh, apatried. I don't know if you guys are uh, familiar with the term. Apatried is the United Nations Convention for people who don't have citizenship. So I lived in that state for about 10 years. I didn't have any country where to go to. I didn't have any citizenship, citizenship to claim. Then as an artist, I just decided that if you don't belong to one country, the world can be your country. So uh, as an indigenous person from Africa, I am becoming, actually I became, I, uh, I went to get myself the title of a global citizen. So I don't see borders to do my art project, to tell my story, to tell my message, because uh, spiritually, I also think that the reason why people like me survive uh, prisons and persecution, but my colleague did not, many of them, just few of us were able to be resilient enough to keep moving as artists, intellectual writers and musician or uh, visual artists is because there was a reason because we wanted to tell that story of those who didn't make it to life, to the world. So I moved to United States for a residency program. I started traveling to the US in 1996 and got very comfortable. And today I use uh, all the power I gather from art to, uh, to go back to Cameroon, the country where I went to prison. And I got all these depression or these traumas to start a community-based organization in my village. And so uh, we have impacted uh, the life of millions of people in the rainforest from the community-based organization. And I also didn't introduce you in the beginning that I come from multi-religious background, you know, uh, from a Muslim family, I went to a Christian school and I also went to pray the, the ancestor and the gods in the shrine in the village. And the village had 3,000 people in the middle of the rainforest. We didn't have running water, no electricity, uh, no good school, no good medical centers. So we walk miles every day to go get wood, to go to farm, to go to school. And so we, in the, um, I created an organization in 2008 and so we have brought water to thousands of people, wheelchair to people with disabilities, and solar energy to, uh, we light about several, about maybe I would say 12 villages with electricity. And uh, our last project is called Radio Taboos, community radio station. We broadcast for about half a million people, 10 languages and from solar energy. And uh, and now we are expecting to uh, to reach one million people by the end of two thousand twenty five. Actually, this is what I'm doing as an artist right now. But since COVID, I've not been performing because uh, I uh, I use a performance uh, body painting performance with live music to address these issues and also to raise funds to address social justice justice issues. And uh, many uh, movies have, have been featured about my work in different facets of uh, how I, I develop my work or I, my underwork, my underwork comes, comes along. And so I wave between the global south and then the global north, you know, trying to get this conversation with the world. You know, so uh, this is sort of <laughs> what I do for now. And what to add, I addressed the United Nations uh, three times. The first time was in 2001 uh, for the 50th anniversary of the Geneva Convention in Paris. And I also addressed the Youth uh, Delegate Human Rights um, uh, United Nations uh, Committee here in Santa Fe. And then my last intervention with United Nations, it was in 2015, after the mass shooting in Paris, because I work for Charlie Hebdo, that satirical newspapers. And so I was one of the four artists to uh, address um, the Human Rights Council panels with three other artists uh, on the response of uh, the killing of the, the 
the journalist and newspaper in Paris. So I lost five friends on that mass shooting. And so uh, this is what I do. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I don't know if you have a question and we can develop that there. Richard? Thank you. Thank you, Issa. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, I'd like to just open this up. We have lots of time yet. We have about an hour if we want to use it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I'd like to just sort of uh, typical of an artist with evidence uh, Zoom session that I've observed in the past. You have wonderful conversations. You introduce and get to know uh, your visitors or your, your guests in those. And I, I think uh, if that can be the structure of what we do next right now, oh, that would be wonderful. So I don't know who, uh, Ali, you have any, you want to start a conversation with Issa maybe, and uh, and we'll all join in. Actually, actually, I want to, inter I want to interrupt myself actually uh, for a moment, uh, just to refer to a pro uh, to some programming earlier in the week as part of this series. Um, which I'm, uh, I, I, I wish we could just sort of dovetail uh, a session we did on uh, Sunday with a man named Jim Enote. And Jim, on his website, uh, his bio says, Zuni Farmer. Uh, he's also the chairman of the board of the Colorado Plateau Foundation. He's uh, the head of the board of the Grand Canyon Trust. He's on the Wilderness Society uh, and many other foundations and organizations. Uh, but he, he uh, one of his presentations the other day dealt with the concept of countermapping an indigenous. And, and for Jim Enote, he lives on Zuni in a place where 600 generations, probably like Issa, 600 generations of family have lived in the same place grown seeds and crops in the same place. And the petroglyphs, the rock art around the edges of the Grand Canyon are the legacy communication, the information of his ancestors. Uh, and uh, Jim and others have been working with, how do we know place? How do we map place? And we have sort of colonial uh, names for places now, Spanish names here in the Southwest, uh, you know, and other names. And yet, uh, and maps are sort of overviews. I know Jim mentioned his mother said, I can't read maps. I'm not a bird. I don't look down at the environment. I look across at the environment uh, toward the horizon. Uh, and there are a lot of cultural aspects to how we no place, how we know ourselves and our ancestry. Uh, and I, I, I thought that was a really interesting dovetail with what's uh, being discussed today here in part. So, but I'm gonna hand it over. Ali, are you prepared to just join in? Actually, I have a question for Ali, if you can go first. Please. Ali, what difference do you make between archive and data? Do you think that the same thing or it's just, Semantic sentences? Um, archive and theater. I think that's a complicated uh, question. Uh, uh, what What do you mean by theater? Let me ask you that. <laughs> well, because you use, you use the word archive instead of data. So do you see any difference? It's just, or just a word and it's all the same thing. That's what I want to know. It's, it's, I think he's just saying data. 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 Oh, data. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I heard theater for some reason and I was very confused. It might be my uh, way down to accent. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think uh, data is also a very complicated uh, thing because I think most of us understand data to be um, um, information specifically within digital spaces, right? The, the binary code uh information that resides within digital spaces or born digital information but um there is um um i, I would for me i would like to actually look at, think about data in an expanded way and specifically uh thinking about digital philosophy which is a theory that was proposed 
uh, a few decades ago uh, that looks at uh, data as being part of uh, all reality. So um, digital philosophy actually breaks down, sorry, digital, yeah, uh, breaks down uh, uh, cosmology, physics, and computer science, and try in a way tries to marry it where it says that uh, actually the uh, the fundamental components of the universe is not carbon but information it is data and so in that sense if one thinks about data as being the um the baseline for all matter material information um both physical digital but also uh, ethereal then in that sense the question of data is where does data begin and where does data end right so that's one one thing when i'm talking about archive i think i mean also uh, the rhizomatic system of how that knowledge or data is organized so within digital spaces you of course have uh, the database, which is the back end of a lot of digital archives, uh, where there is no, uh, no, no narrative exists in the database, right? So uh, Lev Manovich's very important uh, text on the database logic, which talks about how for the history of humanity, actually, we have been tied to time. So narratology is actually uh fundamentally based in time there is no form of communication that we have actually which is outside of time whether it's linear time non-linear time um, um broken time disjointed time these are all forms of narratives so it's still uh exploring time in some way but the database uh in the 20th century actually is the first um event or the first artifact which is outside of time because it does not tell a story it is not it does not have a beginning middle and end in fact all elements of the database or all information within the database is equal so there is no understanding of story within the database so and this is my reading of it that the archive actually is the front end of the database that actually structures that data into a story. The, the archive actually uh, structures meaning uh, to that data, which is so vast that it is uh, outside of meaning within the human scale. So the archive actually gives meaning to data, right? So uh, in that sense, yes, for me, archive is significantly different from data and data is significantly much more vast than any archival system and of course archival systems um, traditionally have been um, related to uh, human scales because they're designed by humans even though they may be talking about uh, levels or, uh, or or scales of data which are cosmological or ecological uh, occurring in nature. So they're vast ideas or vast amounts, but they have always been um, uh, scaled down so that we understand that data. I think it's the first time in human history now in the last 20 decades that uh, we have been uh, confronted or... Um, uh yes confronted actually is the right word we're confronted with big data so scales of data that we cannot comprehend because they are generated by machines and so then when we talk about archives that are holding big data which is machine generated uh, meant and designed for machines uh, we suddenly then are finding ourselves in a situation where uh, data and we have a certain kind of aphasia or disjointedness and that's i think something that is a very interesting time to look at data in so yeah sorry i mean this was a very long question maybe it 
answer your uh, <laughs> thank you thank you Ali. I, I would like to sort of say something about that i mean i it's extremely interesting ali um i was thinking though about a um counterpoint which is not which is different but the same um, which is that at different moments in time historical time trans historical time certain certain people in the world of sapiens and the, the, the human experience have encountered data that was completely unknown to them and couldn't make sense of it right that's happened over and over again in fact it's part of what makes makes colonialism work um bringing bigger knowledge different knowledge more more ability to to take the energy of the universe and bring it to bear in terms of the expression of power so the, the the ships, for example, that took people across either into slavery or into colonial um, conquest, um, invented a way to, to to understand and and control physical experience at a level that was unknown to the people that were being invaded. Um, and that this difference in um, in data generation and its ownership is a way of talking about colonization. Mm -hmm. And democratic liberatory movements both challenge that from a different database, from an indigenous database, from a more grounded human understanding, um, and a resistance to oppression, all of which take time to grow from direct experience to political engagement and in the course of that expanse of time the sharing of data makes it more universally accessible to all so that colonized people can use the information that was previously the cause of their subjugation to in fact engineer liberation but once having but achieved it the limitation of data as understood in each of those historical times has guaranteed, or at least it has shown, that people who win their liberation often replicate what they were fighting against. Because mm -hmm. the database hasn't expanded, the human experience of data. So new big data, it seems to me, is a challenge both to can we be more human through the sharing of that data, through the meaning we give that data, or will we be the same barbaric intrusion on other people because of the um, what I call the malignant belonging that that data gives some people and not others. So the, the malignancy of the belonging is, is in belief systems and belief systems are a way to marshal data, to give it a meaning that is shareable in a discrete framework. Um, so this is not to say that to say anything other than that there's a history that leads to this moment that is fascinating in its rep its replication of exactly what we're experiencing now it's similar to the analogy and i'll shut up the analogy is when people say um the world confronts a disaster we've never known before it depends who the we is right there are people in the on the on the planet who now and at other times have confronted the same disaster that is they could be wiped out and have been wiped out. It's not new to them to experience the danger. Some of us are just learning we confront, right? So it's similar to that. It's that we we assume somehow that the belief system we have and the meaning we give to the data we've generated is in fact synonymous with reality. Ines, you wanna react or I should go? I wanna... I want to add another dimension to this. I think maybe because I've spent the last two weeks at the SETI Institute in California, and we went to, we spent three days uh, at the Allen Telescope Array, where they have 42 antennas just listening to the universe. So the amount of data that is coming in, it's so massive. And they can't even have, not all the antennas are capturing at the same time. I think there was 28 at, at uh, the same time. And the amount of data is so massive that 
it can then be kind of distributed to people doing research, but there was a lot of discussion about like, how is AI being used in processing this data and trying to find patterns? So I'm just thinking like, is pattern, like you were saying, Ali, that uh, with your archive, it's at a human dimension, the way that we can digest it in a way, right? And this is, all this data that we've seen is kind of beyond digestible, <laughs> I would say, because there's so much of it and people are looking into finding patterns. So there's, you know, there's a, an, to an extent, like this idea of binary code and data in that sense. But we were also exploring things like sound, like how can we find those patterns, but using other uh, mediums, you know, like sound or, or color, and that was like a, a part of the part of the the interesting conversations we had there. But I'm thinking about like your archive, even if it's at this human dimension, like you like you say, is there room for these patterns, or you know, like what kind of um, repetition or patterns patterns can you find there, and how does that come through? You know, like in a way that you would like process or digest the archive so just curious uh no when i was talking about human scale i was not specifically referring to my own work but um but i i think this it's it's part of the part of what i was saying that um I, I completely agree that this this idea of uh 42 or even 28 uh, sensors listening to the universe, generating that amount of data. Uh, but but that is just one of the many kinds of data that we're generating every second, every microsecond in today's day and age, whether it's stock info, stock market information, whether it's air traffic data, whether it's, you know, it's, it's we, we are generating a lot of noise, right? So that is the database or databases, as Colin rightly said, because there are multiple uh, databases at play here that are often uh, not mutually compatible or sympathetic to each other. They're also um, uh, antagonistic to each other or in confrontation with each other. And so there is also then the noise of that confrontation uh, of, of, of uh, rightfully the different kind of attitudes towards uh, how information, database, wisdom, knowledges are being even understood as being knowledges. So in that um, technosphere of noise, uh, the idea of meaning making, which is also contested because the idea of meaning itself is, mm -hmm. I think, uh, um, a lot uh, many people would question this the statement of mine that the idea of meaning making is archiving right uh, but even the the idea of non meaning making uh, the idea of counter meaning making uh, is also archiving so uh, the the indecipherable that exists like i'm i'm oversimplifying now um you know bringing it to human scale but the idea of uh, the noise that exists or is generated is databases, but to understand it, to, to uh, arrive at an understanding of what it, it could mean in relation to itself, but also to each other and to us, um, perhaps is a process of archiving. Uh, the, na the narrative element then comes in, you know, so whether it is, uh, in your case, in is the idea of exploring it through sound making or through colors, as you said, uh, would be a process of, uh, in my reading of it, uh, a kind of archive making uh, of, of a kind of a narratology. Okay. But uh, I was also very uh, interested uh, in, in Colin, what you were talking about. I mean, you touched upon um, some very interesting ideas there. I mean, at least of which are the whole is the idea of um of hegemony and the fact that is a counter hegemonic position even possible 
mm-hmm. right? Because when you're talking about um, uh, confronting uh, traditional or, or dominant histories or dominant knowledges with indigenous uh, knowledges and uh, attaining liberation, and then you know you you talked about how the database has not expanded. Uh, that I think is the Gramscian position of the fact that uh, counter hegemonic uh, positions are not possible. That um, that you cannot actually uh, use, uh, as Audrey Lord says, you cannot use the master's tools to burn the ha- master's house down. You have to invent the new tools, and I think um, at least my um hope or desire with the kind of work that i'm doing specifically with digital technologies is that to find within uh the the vastness of technology and digital technology today a way to actually find uh um uh, post colonial democratic free open source um tools uh for imagining or envisioning a, a, a politically conscious future. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can I, can I just say something, Richard, just quickly, just to, uh, I want to make a distinction that I think at least is important to me. Ines, when you talk about the machines listening, um, I'd like to be careful about the word, right? I, I, don't, I don't think that the way a machine listens is the way the people who will listen to what the machine records are listening. <laughs> um, and that distinction, I think, is very critical for what Ali, Ali is talking about. You know, we don't listen the same way. Um, yeah. And the way we listen is a very important a construct for us to have control of and mastery of. If we anthropomorphize the machine, we've lost the struggle for humanity. So, mm-hmm. To recognize the distinctions is very important, I think. I, I'd like to be a bit provocative here and, and add uh, a few I, few concepts to this conversation, which I, I'm really enjoying, especially issues of noise, uh, noise to signal ratio in our over increasingly polluted information environment, because we're not understanding what that is. Um, my sense is, and language and meaning is so important uh, in all of this, uh, to my mind, information is not a noun. It is a verb. It is relational. There is no information without a sender, receiver. It's a process that is continuous. It's an action. It is not a thing. Information is not a thing, even though some, most people, and the word is classified as a noun. It is really a relational uh, action, a verb. Um, one of the things I'm noticing, and we've been discussing this uh, during the program a bit, is the whole issue of information overload, which is being referred to here in, to some extent. Uh, large parts of our societies, not just in this country, but around the world, are in fact, uh, and all of us are uh, experiencing in various ways what we're terming information overload. We're just uh, involved with more and more information. And there's a growing sector of society that is unprepared to know how to, how to understand information and, in fact, are turning off. They're opting for beliefs and for ignorance to ignore. And I find that a very dangerous path forward for large parts of our society uh and uh and it has to do with the speed at which uh in a consumer capitalist society uh technological development is greatly outpacing uh human and social development uh and even education uh and so on the other so uh, i want to talk a bit about those tendencies to actually be uninformed to ignore uh and and also in in the world of information, I, I I tend to want to think about it in ecological terms. There is valuable resource and there is waste production, uh, and lots in between. And waste in the inf- well, uh, valuable resources, wisdom and knowledge, and those very they're qualitative, not quantitative uh, issues. 
uh, and on the uh, waste side of the balancing scale is ignorance and confusion and deception and think those elements. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, and then I'll open it up, is that something is going on in our technological world. That, and I'm provoked by what Ali has been talking about, about digital archiving and so on. Digital is moving aside, uh, not moving away, but we're entering a photonic era in part in terms of our technological systems and understandings. We're moving to uh, work with photons rather than electrons. Uh, and the nature of photonics is very different than electronics. And um, digital logic, binary logic, Boolean logic, if, then, us, them, uh, good, bad, uh, has been imposed on society, not just on technology. And more and more of us in the world are, uh, even our educational systems are imposing digital logic on social interactions and understandings. Light uh, offers a new analog, uh, looking at the nuances uh, between various states of being and doing. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about uh, how that transition is going to be uh, proceeding. You know, the Leonard Cohen uh, line, uh, the crack where the light gets in. I think the light is very important and it offers a whole different philosophical uh, understanding of reality when we, as we move into biogenetic and, and photonic tools. Colin. Yeah, I just want to, I, I, I hate talking so much because I want to hear from Issa some more, but I, but I have to, two things really. One, what you said about information is true of most nouns. The, the word daughter is a relationship. The word husband is a relationship. Most of our nouns are about relationship because who we are is relational. That's right. Um, that That's a fact of human experience. We deny it very often and think of ourselves as lone individuals you know, striking against the world, but that is a fantasy. Um, we can be we can be malign, malignant in our relations, and we can be have goodwill in our relations. But the relationship is is there. Um, when you say we are two, two other things, one you, you you talk about ignorance and turning one's back. I think one of our default positions as humans is is the shame blame kind of thing. I wouldn't call a refusal to face the world as it as we see it as ignorant, but rather a stand that is legitimate in the life experience of those taking it. It may be destructive, self-destructive, but it's a legitimate stance. So it isn't ignorance with respect to, um, to um, idiocy, but rather an ignorance that is about refusing a certain invasion of self and community. And, and that's as real a database as the larger database. And finally, when you talk about systems of education, in most places, most people in schools don't learn what the school is trying to teach. The system has been a failure if it's about bringing people into an understanding of the world they live in. It's been a failure since inception. It's designed to have people live in the world in a particular way. And, and there's enough evidence that the really important thing about going to school is going and sitting there <laughs> and being there and being released from there at a time you have no control over. Colin, um, to serve the market, maybe. To serve the market, to serve the factory, <laughs> to serve the farm, whatever, whatever it is, it's in service too. <laughs> It's not about educating in the sense of culture and freeing the self to explore. Um, we haven't had that system. So whatever the newness of our databases, our photons versus protons, whatever, whatever new is in the environment, our systems have been fairly consistent to reject that newness for most people. We have not introduced people to the world we, we impose on them. And therefore, they are... are they are weaker and more subjugatable. Um, so, I, so I think it's really important to be clear that we don't have systems that educate. We have systems that miseducate and freeze people in place. Um, in, in, in the US, for example, it's, it's been the case since the inception of the common school 
that 60% of the kids that enter fail at whatever the point of conclusion is. When it was the third grade, when it's the high school, when it's the first two years of college, 60% fail. Um, we don't have a system that includes people, even in the in the limited um, humanity, we've social humanity we've created in a capitalist system. We, we, we have systems that are designed consciously or unconsciously to exclude people. And those excluded people still live lives. And there's much to be learned by how they live those lives. And we don't look at that as the subject of our scholarship by and large. Um, can I go? Please. Yes. So as an indigenous person who bring information to people who never have any, um, because when I read my own life, I used to take, I used to design cartoons to educate people how to read and write through the bubbles and then pictures. And that was my young age as an artist and activist. But as I age, I'm bringing radio to people who never listened to radio before because about 35% of listeners never listened to radio before. They are rainforest people, they're pygmies. They listened to the radio the first time in 2017 when we launched the radio station. So, and then my work has always been as a cartoonist to break down everything that is very complicated for people to understand. So when I hear you talk about data, archive, the only thing I can tell in educated people what it is, is information, you know? And then that's something that helped them to grow. But when I look at that, I also think that there are a known and a known data and a known archive out there. Why am I saying that's because do we even know how the Egyptian, the Incas, the Aztecs, the Thai pyramids were built? Do we know? Those are data we don't know how these thing was on earth when a civilization uh, rise, right? We just know they are there, but we never question them. Even though we question, we just don't know how and what they are. <laughs> we know what they was doing, what how they was built. We, we, do we know how these, these was uh, constructed? It's just we know about slaves, that's all we know. Hmm. Because we only know that there was very uh, high intelligent civilization before that extent. And then we don't know how, that today if we have to replicate the, uh, the pyramids, the Egyptian one, even the Inca one, we will not know how to do it, right? Do we know? Those are data, right? Sitting in front of us, we know that their knowledge, their tremendous information, tremendous archive, you know, techniques and science. But do we know how it was made? I, I think the, I, I think the question, I think the, the the answer is that we don't know yet. I think that <laughs> is a very important addition to the question that you're asking. Like, yeah, do sure. we know yet? And I think that is the fundamental of how we are going about uh, seeking knowledge. Because we are always at a place where we don't know everything, and that is the position that 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 uh, is, I think, by default that we don't know yet, uh, but we definitely know more than we did ten years ago, and we knew more ten years ago than we did twenty years ago. In fact, I think I read a a, a paper about how um, uh, uh, Egyptologists actually have found evidence of hydraulics in uh, uh, in 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 the pyramids just uh, last month. So I think there's always something that is going to there's something new that we're going to learn. And if we do not believe that, then we're in a lot of trouble, yeah. right? <laughs> even you. though even though when we know, what would we do with it? Yeah, because I, that's a different. I think that's a different question. It's a very different question. It's a, a completely different question. 
Yes, because this civilization have a tremendous resources, tremendous research, but we haven't improved a lot in the world. You know, I don't understand why polio were eradicated in the US and it's still wandered in Africa, India, Nigeria, and all those countries. You know, maybe, that's maybe. one thing I don't get. Second thing, to reduce uh, human demography on earth, we need to give, we need to put knowledge in the hand of women. You know, I'm talking to a person who, whose mother infanted 10 children, which I'm number seven. So my work in the village is trying to give knowledge in the hand of, put knowledge in the hand of women so they know how to read a cycle. They can decide how many babies they're gonna have in a lifetime, not to, to make sure that they have information, knowledge in their hands so they can manage and live better and well, not to struggle like my mother did with 10 kids without knowledge and even married other women for, his dad, for, his, for her husband. You know, she has a poor life. This is why I always have this conversation from extreme poverty to overdeveloped world, like the United States, <laughs> you know? So, and this has been my struggle the whole time as an artist or intellectual or thinker. But Issa, I think another way of saying what you're saying and what Ali is saying is that um, the, the challenge is, does our, can does and can our generation of knowledge at the levels at which we're doing it now, add up to an ability to challenge injustice and poverty globally that can can that happen are we at a new stage in knowledge generation which has defied us until now it will mean challenging power in a whole new kind of way i have yeah. an image in my, i have an image in my mind um which is really about indigenous knowledge and confronting another kind of knowledge my grandmother who was a peasant woman from Eastern Europe, went to England. She traveled. Who knows how she managed to do it? She landed in London. She didn't speak a word of English. She mastered that. She lived a life with her four children and her husband. They lived. They were able to converse and do commerce. When she undressed at night in front of the television that her husband liked to watch, it was the first time they encountered television, she wouldn't undress because she thought they could see her on the other end of the television. And that feels to me like it's microcosmic of where we are in confronting a whole bunch of knowledge systems. You know, we're afraid because we don't know what it's seeing of us, um, but we have to take mastery of what we want to be seen through right so it has to be a value-based generation and we have to know more and more about ourselves so we're talking about the world beyond us but the questions you're asking have to do with learning more and more about us what, what are we generating new in the data about ourselves that really helps brain science goes a certain part of the way Psychoanalysis went a certain part of the way. Biology goes a certain part of the way. But we don't really understand the human mind as a data generating apparatus. The, the, to conquer in the past, there were uh, archives that was heading because there was an agenda to achieve. And today, we are, there are too much uh, data that we can actually we are overwhelmed by it. You know, that's what I also think that that's another strategy to uh, confuse humanity because uh, we have so much knowledge today that we can improve the world. But what I'm thinking from what Ali says is that when we have knowledge, right, we should improve something in the civilization. So the generation after us would be we will live better and i don't think we are putting human in the center of our interest that's what i'm reading yeah the this is this is me uh my phd uh researcher brain right now just uh listening to everybody and like yes that is adorno that is the of course <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> and because and this is i mean this is um I mean, you're absolutely right, Isa. I think that 
uh, there are systems in place, uh, structural systems. Uh, and, and this is exactly, I think when Colin, you were um, responding to Richard's uh, comment, and I was thinking that uh, the what is on the opposite end of the spectrum from knowing and knowledge and uh, wisdom is not ignorance, is disinformation and propaganda. And I yes. think this is exactly what you're talking about, Isa, that uh, there are structural, yes, definitely there are structural systems in place that are designed uh, by uh, entities known to us, uh, governments and uh, capitalist um, uh, superstructures that are... Um, oh God, uh, organized religion. An organized religion, Which yes. I mean, organized problem. religion is the first capitalist superstructure. So, yes, indeed. Uh, indeed. you know, uh, the the first um, multinational corporation actually was uh, 11th century AD, where uh, multiple uh, kings sought the blessing of the Pope to go sack Jerusalem. That was 11th century AD, and that went on for the next um, multiple decades. So, I mean. You know, so uh, sanction, um, yes, organized religion, I would put it in a capitalist uh, superstructure any day. So, uh, but, but yeah, so disinformation <laughs> campaigns where the, and, and then, you know, so then, then it is important also then to question what does, what do ideological words or principal words like liberation for example or freedom mean right because when you and i think about freedom we think about freedom in a very specific way but then when these uh, superstructures uh, think about freedom uh, they think about freedom uh, being the freedom to open new markets you know, yes, why yes. is it that we want to go to, I mean, not we, you and I don't want to go to Mars, I'm sure. Uh, but why do certain entities want to go to Mars or to the moon? It's not for the opening up of the frontiers of human um, development, imagination or understanding or even uh, human space, right? It's It's specifically for... The, the freedom to open new markets on the moon, on Mars, wherever, you know, uh, to e extract resources. And the extractivist model actually is the basis of the capitalist model, uh, where you and I, we are um, uh, reconfigured to be consumers, where we are not simply... Um, uh, um, entities that are uh, consuming uh, things but as consumers we are convinced coerced compelled manipulated and directed to uh, purchase um, digital content social values political ideologies economic produce cultural experience i mean it's our something. entire relationship with the world is that of consumption and then it's in the social or political it. or um, uh, ecological uh, space, the eyeball economy or the attention economy or the consensus uh, becomes the basis of the neoliberal uh, capitalist reality. And it's creating a need, right? It's something we've had uh, coming up in a lot of our discussions before. Yeah. There's this need and this scarcity mind. If if you feel like you need this, then that's how you, you're also controlled, right? Exactly. And I think, I mean, yeah. Sorry, not to cut you. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I think Colin will have a lot to say on that. Yeah, too. no, because we were talking about this also and uh, just also thinking that it's not just then that we are treated as consumers that uh, are responding to a need that is manufactured, but also that we are uh, in a post-Fordist system where we are expected to uh, um, financialize ourselves. So we have to create the value and then sell that value that we have generated for ourselves. And everything, every interaction actually is financial. You, you name any interaction in the world and I will explain to you how it can 
be seen through a system of financial transaction you know and that's the world that we are uh, living in that's that's why i think it's important to use the word capitalism carefully i mean you 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 threw it back into a historical time frame and clearly all the elements are there but this particular formation of those elements is a very yes. particular one yes. um and and core, and, and core in it are two things i think much like you're saying but one is 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 the manufacture of debt um debt is the for, is a form of contemporary slavery um and it's it, it includes sovereign debt so countries are beholden to a narrow group of debt holders and that limits what can happen in those countries um and choice which is also manufactured is those consumers we as consumers believe we're making choices, but those choices are manufactured choices. We don't actually experience choice, right? We experience yeah. selection amongst choices given us. Um, but selection is another form of, of scarcity framing. Yeah. Um, and, and indebtedness is a form of, of, of institutionalizing scarcity and owning it. Um, so we, we have deep institutional structures that keep this system moving. Um, and I think the question about the, inf just to go back to information, because we could, we could talk Adorno and Benjamin and we can go to, to, you know, Foucault, but, but the, the problem is, the problem is bigger than, than, than those frames of reference. They're accurate, but they don't capture the fact that how we change this is still beyond our reach. We can do it on an individual basis. We can serve a community. We can rebuild a village. But how we actually make that a universally shared phenomenon is at this point beyond our reach. And what the science is for learning about how we do that, I think is also there, but it hasn't been culled. And we haven't figured out how to make it, how, how, to have, how for it to meet power. Because power doesn't just go away, right? It, it, um, even when confronted, it doesn't go away. One of the things we're seeing in these right-wing movements of the world is that they've been building their capacity to resist what was happening to the post in the post-colonial world, to resist it and turning it around. Um, and neoliberalism and indebtedness have gone together to do that. Austerity is the philosophy that has guided the world back into servitude. Yeah, uh, Colin is right, but um, I love these metaphor of the snake biting its own tail. Yeah, because when I observe the society, there is a one side that destroyed uh, our humanity, and another side trying to fix it. Who are people like us who are aware? But I also want to bring out that um, you know activists don't brainstorm every. Monday morning, but the corporation do, you know, how are they going to use science? How are they going to use research? How are they going to buy whoever to bring even any theory to, uh, to turn around the truth so they can keep expanding? But after the market, the top one is power, right? And above power, what were they trying to reach? What the capitalists capitalist system want to reach is ego is what who are we combating here Colin? Well, in a sense we're combating ourselves even though we claim we're on the other side right we, it's still us people I mean, who look like us right yeah, well, yeah but yeah race is a very interesting phenomenon in this discourse i think because you know, science will tell you there is no such thing right race is, is a a myth a mythical construct but the data of difference allows people, if they choose, if their belief system calls them to it, to actually ignore that science and see only the difference they see to justify the difference they want. Yes, because you're racist until the day that you want a kidney. So you can get it from India, from Bushmen in Austria, Africa, or from any indigenous in the Central America, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then you recognize that the other people are human. Yeah. So I think we need to bring people intellectual to think. I don't think we recognize them as human. We recognize them as we recognize them as parts that can support our humanity. Sure, sure. But sometimes we reject them, even though uh, you know we can reject them in public. Our whole life, we are 
Yeah, absolutely. This is a good example. Until one day we need to live longer to see our family, to be around our people, so we can take an organ from anywhere. Yeah. At that moment, because we need to survive, we don't we 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 can get it now. Now we are not racist. <laughs> right? So it should be taught when we are uh, uh, children, you know, so we can grow up with values and the sense of inclusion, tolerance for good. So uh, I think we should put humanity in in the center of everything we do, yeah, not I, the market, not I, the I, I, Forgive me just for saying this, but when we one of our early conversations, Ali and Ines, I I I, I used a quote from Shakespeare. I think it's from Richard II, but I think it's pertinent here. The eye, the eye can't see itself seeing, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> we see we see through distortion. And our science has to do with refining the distorting mechanism. So we see more and more close to the truth, but we never get there. Um, and that humility about what we see and how we see seems to me to be critical in terms both of how we use new knowledge and how we relate to each other. That if we recognize that whatever limitations we see in the other, however we construct the other, is an element of our distorting system. Nobody is quite who we see they are. Yes. Which is taking me to my philosophy of duality, you know, because the way you feel yourself, that is the way you appear to the public, right? So I'm taking, I took, you know, this is why my performances are very important to me because when I work with the pattern of my work, on my skin, whether in China or in New York or in Paris, people just see African walking by as uh, with a bucket of water because I used to carry water as a kid, you know. But you have to come to my talk to actually, you know, have that connection with me to know how I feel inside, you know. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of duality, you know, right. the way we see the world and the way we feel inside. It can also be. Uh, the community also, because when you in, in the community, is not the same spirit as you are outside, in out of your comfort zone. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's why. But that's why experience goes beyond information, right? Absolutely. I'm thinking about my background with creating science exhibitions. It was, for me, never about the information that I'm conveying there. It's about the experience that you go through. Because information, you know, you can just Google whatever, but if you go through something that you experience that evokes an emotion in you, then you can go beyond the information and, and explore it by yourself. And I think it links with what Ali was saying, our our desire to seek for more and to continue to explore. So it's not just about like what you get digested by someone, by some source of, of you know, right. information online, offline, whatever it is. So it goes really beyond that. And so that's why when you're bringing up the, the like to focus on the humanity, I think it's it's really about focusing on the emotions and also, right? Like w what does it trigger in you? What does it evoke in you yes, when yes. you're going through it? Have we lost Richard? I think it is just listening quietly. Ah. <laughs> I did, yes. Oh, I want to share with Ines that I tried to type in Google the year that Hamas won election because the international community organized um, election in in Palestine for the Palestinian to vote, you know, and the Hamas won the election, but it was denied by international community. So uh, during this uh, war in Gaza, I went back online to try to search for that information. What here, Hamas won election in Gaza and uh, I couldn't find anything, you know, for some reason. But I knew as a young, uh, aware, uh, informed person, because I was going to be a radio producer that these, information would be very important to me to see what's going on in the history of Palestine, how the struggle is in the Middle East. I could not find that information accurately. 
Right. So it's also tell us that the data could be manipulated, you know. Sure. And a, lot of, a lot of it is unknown too, right? To us as a public. I mean, we know that the Netanyahu government funded Hamas. We know that the US government funded Al Qaeda. Um, we know about those things late in the day, but it, it, these aren't these aren't sort of um, uh, creations in and of themselves. They're promoted uh, in ways that are part of somebody else's chessboard. I might just uh, step step in and mention this, making reminding me of a conversation I had uh, just at the transition uh, uh, during the Gorbachev era. Uh, of the end of the Soviet Union. I, I was in Washington, D.C. for a, a, an unrelated meeting uh, at which, uh, during a break, uh, I entered a conversation with a gentleman who was, uh, he didn't say which intelligence agency he was with, but he was one with one of the U.S. intelligence agencies, fairly high level. Uh, I think he was with the Defense Intelligence Agency, actually. But he described something to me that uh, was fairly fascinating. I think Ali referred to it a bit. He said, uh, for many years, the U.S. and the Soviets, the British as well, others, uh, have been keeping secrets from each other. Uh, you know, it was a world of secrecy, the world of mm -hmm. espionage. Um, and over, uh, over a few generations of secret keeping, uh, uh, it turns out we had kept secrets from ourselves that mm -hmm. the next of employees didn't know the truth of a certain situation. We had totally uh, undermined our own understandings. And so there was in the early U.S.-Russian relationship, uh, there was an agreement to not keep secrets anymore, but to uh, move into a new form of uh, in so-called intelligence uh, uh, by uh, just overloading each other with too much information and generating a climate of confusion to undermine social processes and systems as well as political systems and economics. That just to that confusion in, is still a, a big part of our information environment, especially uh, as manipulated by those who seem to want to be in control. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, if you can share a story, is um, there is also mindset because the first time we brought radio to people who never listened to the radio, we discovered that there is a hear, a ear, how to, or a mindset how to listen to a radio, because the indigenous people would listen to a conversation or the radio between the host and the guest, and then. The host would go around the village trying to greet people and people say, we listen to you, but you were saying nasty thing about this and that. And he had to defend himself by saying that, no, it wasn't me. I was the guest talking uh, to, I was, in, I, I was the host. And then I had a guest who are conversing with, he's the one who say those things. I think also accessing new data or new information there is a mindset for that, you know. You remember, Ines, how you in California have to listen to uh, sounds, and because you also set your mind to listen to it, you know, it could you could have been listening to uh, prepared to listen to sound, but maybe get something else than than the sound data. Will you be happy or not? What do you think? Mm -hmm. You could be expecting uh, some of some of the information, or maybe it already framed for you before. But when you plug your uh, ear plug, and then you can listen to something else, will that be satisfying or not? It is, it is a like Colin was saying. It's not listening to sound. It's listening in the sense of gathering data that then can be translated, and it could be translated into sound or into image or, or color or anything like that. Sure. The, the thing was that it's just such a huge amount of data that the question just started going into, can we humans actually do it? Or <laughs> do, we, do we need then, you know, AI and algorithms that can process all that, all that data. So then 
even the the AI that we would be using, it would still be in a way biased by whatever we are putting into it. So it's still going to narrow it all down to this human dimension, right? So, and it can be much bigger than that, right? We can be listening to a civilization that is uh, no longer, that no longer exists, right? Because of the way uh, that that uh, things travel. So there are so many questions that come up and that make us feel quite small <laughs> in a way. But but it's really fascinating and whatever, if we start thinking about the patterns and, you know, it can be that in all that data, there is one thing that looks like a pattern, but that the human eye or ear or instinct will miss. And so, and so that's kind of the... I would say that's part of the fascination, like talking to a scientist that was like listening to to a lot of this and looking for these patterns. I asked her like, what is the drive to continue listening in a way? You know, and I think it's it goes back to what Ali was saying. It's this desire of seeking and continuing to 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 engage and to no, for the stuff. pure pleasure of knowing, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I um, wanted to also just uh, say that, um, you know, Isa, when you started with your own introduction, you were talking about um, uh, becoming through circumstances, a person who um, that borders didn't recognize. And so now you don't recognize borders. I would like to put it in that way. And uh, when uh, Colin was talking about um, this distinction between the fact that there is no such thing as race, that it is scientifically uh, a null entity, that it does not exist, but that racism exists, right? right? Um, in the same vein as when <coughs> Richard was talking about information is a verb, racism is a verb. and. Uh, I was just thinking about how, again, in the same way, Isa, when you were talking about borders, borders do not exist. Borderization does, and it's an active. Uh, it's it's an active. Um, it, it's a verb. It's an activated uh, gerund of uh, uh, of of a phenomena that, in reality, does not exist. But we are led to believe that. We are living in a borderized world, and and borderization actually, um, according to uh, Ashil Mbembe, he's one of my favorite um, uh, political theorists, and I refer to his work a lot. Uh, and he talks about borderization as a process that causes reinforcement, reproduction, and intensification of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Right, and that. I think for me, that is a very important thing to think about because when we're talking about information also in the ways that we have talked about it today, uh, there are ways in which information is borderized and that it ways in which we actually have um, uh, started believing uh, in the disinformation of knowledges that we believe that there are uh, worlds of knowledges that are uh, overlapping, but they do not meet. So the world that Isa, you're talking about of your of the village in Cameroon, where people have not uh, listened to the radio uh, as being distinctly separate from the world that I'm talking about, which is interested in uh, archival processes and and data and the universe as being data, but these are not mutually uh, disconnected uh, worlds. These are connected worlds. It is simply that we have not yet arrived at the language to connect these worlds in the ways that would make sense to us. Yeah. Yeah at a given moment of time. I mean, sure, there are other people who have done it. I haven't done it and maybe we haven't done it, but it is it has been done. For example, I'm just thinking about um, 
in the southern part of india in kerala especially which is uh, very very famous for people starting libraries in remote villages that are even not accessible by road or boat or other forms of transport in fact one of my friends was talking about how he comes from a village where his entire village has not um heard of what a train is so they don't know what a train which is a vehicle on tracks is you know uh, it's that remote you know but there's a library there and there's a library there where works of gorky works of uh uh, um, uh, you know, different uh, playwrights, uh, Chekhov, there's uh, uh, different uh, uh, leftist theorists, there's works by um, uh, uh, Marx, you know, so, so books are there. It's not connected by train, it's very remote, but books are there, and people read, and people try and connect, and I think that essentially is uh, what the drive even to listen to the universe is all about the drive to connect to each other and to to know just yeah. simply to know I, I mean the purpose of that knowing is a secondary question and perhaps <laughs> even irrelevant uh, because as long as I know then at least I know that I can do something with that yeah. but if I don't know I don't even I don't even know what I don't know you know, so, so, I think it's a very I... interesting time that we are living in also where we think we know everything, yeah. you know, we are living in a time that has collapsed history uh, and, and especially the architecture of knowledge today. Um, I know we spoke about this uh, previously and Colin, you had, you, you found it very contentious, but I'm going to repeat it, maybe this time a bit better. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because I've been thinking about this idea of what archival time can mean, as opposed to an idea of uh, his, historical time, which is a kind of time which is rooted in a form of linearity, where one thing happened after another, and, and multiple things happened parallel to each other, but also in, in that sense of, the, of time being linear. But now, because of the way in which information is organized and made accessible to us, even with its disinformations and its gaps and the, the secrecies uh, and, and the conspiracies, I think we are also living in a time where we think we know everything uh, instantaneously. We can Google anything from anywhere and know it. And that has created a kind of a collapse in time where uh, we are in a space where the illusion of knowing is so great that we don't anymore know what we don't know. I, yeah. I mean, can I pick this up since, since you were reflecting on the conversation? I, I, I think that I don't, I don't disagree with that at all, except I would phrase it as that's, that's who we are at this moment. Yeah, not, exactly. That's not, what I mean. Not, not that we were different before. So, for example, the Inquisition thought it knew everything. Yes. Right. The divine right of kings explained everything. Um, we've been there before. We keep repeating it. And that mm. seems to be the interesting question. I just want to say that the the way the people who never listen to radio and then the people who are navigating in your world, what we haven't bring to them that knowledge is maybe the torch to show the, the data and the knowledge that's around them. Because when we build a radio station, People think that they want they may start making calls. We tell them no, you can't make calls, but radio is powerful in the sense that when somebody's in the studio, the airwaves are around you naturally. You don't buy them like you buy credit to make a call from your cell phone. You know what I mean? But the airwaves are around you. So we use that radio station even to when because we live in a rural area and then the river, when the rivers are flooded the kids can go to school because they walk to school and they have to cross these rivers, right? So they stay home and then we broadcast the courses from the classes from the studio and then they get them home in the day of heavy rain. <coughs> you know, so mm. these knowledge are around people and then they're willing to access them. So it's like a bringing a torch to highlight what knowledge is around them. They also have their own wisdom for generations and centuries, you know, 
Yes, Richard. Uh, unfortunately, we're coming to the close of this session. We could go on for quite a while. But thank everybody. I'm sorry to have to cut off this uh, wonderful conversation. We're just getting rolling here. Um, yes. <laughs> so, so we're having a momentum. <laughs> yeah, it takes a while. Um, I, I look forward to uh, to staying in touch with everybody and for Issa to and uh, and artists with evidence to stay in touch uh, that that dealt with some of these issues as well from various perspectives. And I well, I hope people tune in tomorrow uh, and that some of our participants rejoin us tomorrow for the information commons an open discussion about many other things we haven't discussed. Colin is back and that Colin's we will here. discuss. And uh, there is a general call in the chat mode and online for Colin to do his poem uh, before we end this session. So, okay. so can, can I just say the thought I had and I'll very, do it very quickly, which we don't ask the question. This is my hallmark question. We don't ask the question, what does love look like? What does it sound like? What do we know about it? What allows us to have this conversation in a camaraderie setting where we're not fighting with each other? What do we know about the humanity of that? It's not in our questions. It's not in the question of what do I know, but but what is love? What is that all about? And I don't I don't know of a of a knowledge base around that. I know that the great sociologist Petrim Sorokin was the head, was the chair of the president of the American Sociological Association until he created an institute to study love. And then he got cut off. <laughs> let me let me get let me get the phone. <laughs> well, I like that. Uh, uh, any any program that ends with love and me, hearts on the screen okay, is so worth me, our time. Let me try to read this. It's called for, for your information. My hopingness is raising a barn. Neighbors help. That's what neighbors do. To store the nutrients that hope lives on. Picking music out of a storm. The cesspool is a worry. The lines tend to back up. Maybe to drown out hope. No hope? What a dope. You could have, should have known. To raise the barn and learn what neighbors do. After that is this, ravenous for meaning, best raise a barn, the warehouse of hopingness, the way neighbors do. Let's do what neighbors do. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Colin. Uh, I look forward to hopefully seeing some of you tomorrow in our Information Commons extended discussion. We can carry on a little bit of what we've just cut off here. See you tomorrow. See you in the future. Thank you bye -bye. very much. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. It was nice to see the debate bye -bye. with you. Bye. Likewise, Bye. Isa. Bye. You. bye, Ali. Bye, bye. Ines. Bye. bye, Colin. Bye, Isa. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you soon, Lisa. See you soon.